Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that wants everyone to know that today's technology is nice and all, but it'll never compare to the TV, record player, liquor cabinet combo extravaganza we had as a kid. Oh, man. I was thinking of a good joke for nice and all, but man, when you said that, that just took my heart. You remember them cabinets? Man, I can still smell it. Yeah. Yeah. Mom would go to the rec store, come home, you go over and peel that lid up. Man. And smell them electronics. Yeah, loved it. It was good stuff, I man. I wish I had a big old console still. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, they sound great, man. <laughs> 40,000 pound record player, but they were cool. But they had the best sound to them. Mm, yeah, that was good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we need. We need them. Everything uh, old is new again for me. It is. I love it. I do too, man. It's hard to beat that old stuff. I love it. Love what's, it, love it. What's going on, dude? Guess what? Same old, same old. Same old, same old. <laughs> just kidding. We're recording today stuff. and just ready to do this. It's a dang good day. It is a good day. All right then. Back in the crack house. Yes, it is. You got any good shout outs? Anybody you want to talk about before we get going? Hey, hey. hey look at that. Look at that. He's ahead of the game. You know what that means, don't you? Hey, tell us. Man, we have uh, all kind of goodies today. And if we go over two minutes, I'm sorry, send me an email. <laughs> You're going to have to take it today. Okay, first one up. We got a five star. Five star, five star. Apple podcast review from Shay Nicole. Shay Nicole. And it says, awesome exclamation point. I love listening to y'all, which we dig. My husband doesn't really like podcasts, but when I'm listening to this podcast, my husband will stop and listen with me. You both do a wonderful job. Well, thank you. Thank well, you very thank much. thank you so much, Shane Nicole. And, next and up, to your husband, too. Oh, yeah. What's up, dude? We dig it. Thanks for listening. Uh, we didn't, I wouldn't shout out your name, but I didn't get it, so you just, thanks, husband. Okay. And now we have another five-star. Five-star, five-star. Podcast review, Apple, from uh, Honeybee's Mama. What's up, Honeybee's Mama? <clears throat> Says, uh... Huge fan, been listening to them for years. I'm assuming them is us. I am always excited to hear the newest episode. So we really appreciate Honeybee's Mama for chiming in. Honeybee's Mama, yeah. yeah. You know Honeybee, right? Yeah, Honeybee's Mama. <laughs> yeah. Okay, man, check this out. Wait a minute, I'm going to do this. Hey. Because we got, we got some folks chimed in over on our uh, our Spotify, man. So uh, we appreciate this. Check this out. It's, uh, this is on our uh, episode from last week. With Bev Sadler? Yes, with yes. Bev Sadler. And it says, the question that popped up was, what did you think about this episode? So we had Ann Marlin, and it says, on to number 127. Bless her and her family for all they've been through. Bev was right, power corrupts. Y'all were very respectable and considered in the questions given what she has been through. Thanks so much, uh, Ann Marlin. Well, thank you very much. We and try to be very respectful and considerate yeah, of everybody. We love everybody, man. We ain't trying to trash nobody. No. Well, some people deserve it. We got so many ways you're bound to like some of them. <laughs> there you go. And uh, our boy C Way Thirty Two, old Chris, appreciate you, boy. Once again, political corruption at the heart of a mystery. Davina was sadly in one of those wrong places, wrong time scenarios. She simply did not commit suicide. Period. Exclamation point. Wow. Great interview and episode. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate that, bro. And we got one from Jessica Grissom eighty four. Says, love this podcast. And we'd love for y'all to do an Arkansas case. So we need to do for one for Arkansas. Arkansas, okay, so we will. Write that down. Okay, write it down. Yeah, write that on our board we don't have. Now, and we have one more, and this one uh, better get some Kleenexes out. This is from uh, Sierra Hart. Thank y'all so much for showing so much interest in my Aunt Dee's case. My grandparents, mom, and aunt have done their best to keep her story alive, and I can't thank y'all enough for your support. Wow. Man. Whew. That is Davina's niece. Yes. Thank you so much, Sierra. Yeah. yeah. We thank you bunch. Wow. Yeah. Man, really appreciate all you guys taking the time to type a few words out there for us. Man, it means a lot. Uh, we love doing what we do, but, man, that just makes it awesome. Yeah. So thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. The Davina case is pretty special to us. Yeah. It's uh, pretty awesome. It is. Mm. I, hate, I hate it for the family. That was cool. Yeah. Very cool. But if anybody wants to be like those fine folks and go to Apple Podcast and leave a rate and review, you certainly can. And we will give you a big old shout out. We will. We'll try. And write something on Spotify. Yeah. Click that five star there, too. That's pretty cool, man. I love yep. that. And you can go to the website and get you a t-shirt. Click on the store page and just do all that stuff there. Yeah, man. Yeah. I think, good stuff. Yeah. Very good. But other than that, dude, we're going to get going on this episode because this is a this kind of long episode, but we're going to get it done and... This is a interesting case, and this was actually suggested to us. Yes, it was uh, suggested to me for my, my boy Mondo. Man, I appreciate you. He's from down in uh, Georgia, but now living up here in Hickory, and uh, he's my buddy. Me and him uh, went to the big uh, wrestling fan fest in Charlotte this past weekend, and uh, 
he told me he'd really like love for us to do this case and cover it. And I said, sir, you got it. We done it. Yeah. And then, uh, shout out to dogs fan 8523. Here's another Georgia case. Write it on the list. Yeah. They said they wanted a Georgia case. So killing two birds with one stone. Yeah. We pointed out a couple and I'm sure he's already, I'm sure they already listened to it, but, uh, here's an Ed. Yeah. An Ed. An Ed. <laughs> that means another one. It does. It does. It's not around here though. It just means an Ed. But like I say, uh, we're going to be in Georgia on this episode, but our, the story we got this week, Dale, starts with a guy by the name of Carl Isaacs. Yes. And at the time that we're starting this story, he was 19 years old. Right. And it had been described that Carl, he was a little bit of a truant, um, a runaway. And at one point, he had been diagnosed with some depression, uh, some self-image. Yeah, um, a lot of angry emotions. And he stuff. did, but, yeah. But it's kind of odd to me because, you know, his mom really was uh, – uh, not much of a mom. She had, a, she had lots of kids. These kids were really uh, neglected and stuff. So I'm wondering when he ever got diagnosed. That's kind of odd, but I'm sure it was all true. Yeah. Yeah, it so could have been. Had yeah. rough, they had a rough, rough childhood. Yeah, it been reported, too, that he had a hostility toward women. Mm. And this could have stemmed from his mom just Very not, much so. Very yeah. much so, yeah. Not taking care of all of his siblings and stuff. Right. I mean, yeah. it was bad. Like, she had like 12, I think. Yeah. A couple of different dudes. They even put them in foster homes at one yeah, time. Yeah, she was drunk and then actually just left them. I think eventually. It's, it's pretty sad, actually. And old Carl at one time he uh, was living in a boarding house and he'd uh, even prostitute himself out to a pedophile in exchange for room and board. It's yeah, a bad way to live, man. Yeah, this was one dur- during one of his escapes from a foster home and the juvenile system and periods on the street. So this is what he had been doing, dude. So he's just to get by, yeah. Just trying to, just trying to live. Yeah, yeah. So our story goes back to the early seventies. Yeah. So by early nineteen seventy, when Carl was sixteen, he was stealing cars pretty regular and burglarizing homes. Mm-hmm. And the same year, he was arrested for the first time. Yeah. Finally got caught. Yeah, and the second arrest for car theft, breaking, entering in Maryland. Uh, quickly followed all that mm-hmm. and he was sentenced to the maryland state penitentiary oh and, my dear. yeah that and, seems pretty pretty rough for second time arrest but i guess he wasn't playing with car theft well i guess they seen what he'd come from and it was just trying to him being that young right. trying to get him some help too but it's just keep him off the street and keep him safe of course you know if he wouldn't have done anything we'd say there it is and again <laughs> not doing anything to him so yeah so this starts out with them actually doing something to him so they're doing better but he arrived at the maryland state penitentiary on march the 27th 1973 and it was just two days later there was a riot broke out and carl uh was raped by fellow inmates for over eight hours yeah he was a small dude he was like what i think 120 140 pounds yeah. or something five foot something like five foot eight five foot nine yeah, yeah he's, so he's pretty small in stature so i'm sure they can when when the riot broke out and they took over the, the cell block i'm sure they just kind of did what they wanted yeah eight hours yeah. Mm-hmm. took turns with him and everything yeah that's yeah. a long time i don't know who had a timer on it but that's a long time yeah either way yeah, it was that was bad. Yeah, not good. No, 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 but I'm sure during the riot, uh, the guards they couldn't do anything. No, no, definitely not. Uh, uh-uh. they probably had you know did good to get yourself out. Probably. Yeah, but it was just ten days later after this riot, he was transferred to the Maryland Correction Camp, and then on April the 25th of 1973, he was transferred to the minimum security center this was in poplar hill Hmm. maryland yeah now carl he had a half brother his name was wayne coleman right and he was 26 years old yeah a little bit older and he had been in and out of uh prisons and institutes pretty much his entire life and just like carl he had been arrested for uh, car thieving and burglary and and he had already been at poplar hill for several months when Carl got there. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. They didn't know each other was there, and when he got there, he was really surprised to see him, mm-hmm. which also surprises me because, you know, same as Wayne. Why was Wayne at the minimum security right off the bat when he was 26, and he sent the young guy to the state penitentiary? I don't know, dude. This was early 70s. They were telling how they, they worked the system back yeah, then. Yeah, and I guess they, they could be a lot of background stuff that they, you know, added on, I guess. They could have been how things were set up as far as 
the the population couldn't get in one place and they had to put them somewhere else. Right. Well, I got. They a had question. a bed for them. I got questions. You know. Yeah. You know I, I oh, you got lots of questions. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Now Wayne, he didn't crave uh, control and admiration like uh, Carl did, yeah, but he, it was reported that Wayne was shy and kind of awkward. Yeah, Carl wanted to be attention. He did. He I wanted. Think he had that what he called Napoleon syndrome. He probably did. He's a small and small in stature, but he was showing. He didn't care. He's yep. kind of like Pee Wee Gaskins in that. In that. Kind of. Yeah. But as soon as Carl got to Poplar Hill, he sought out his brother. Yeah. And they, you know, Carl, he had, he was described as a fast talk, giant ego, like you said, and just, he swayed his brother Wayne into an idea to escape. Right. Mm-hmm. But... His brother Wayne only had one provision to this, and this is where he said that he must be able to bring a friend with him mm. on the escape. Yeah, see, Carl, he when he was young, so he pretty much raised a lot of, you know, he had a lot of younger siblings too, so he kind of raised them with no, you know, with the mama being out, kind of out of the picture. Well, I mean, she was there, but you know what I mean. And the dads were gone, so he would teach them what the only thing he knew. He would, they would go to some antique stores and uh, stores and uh, steal stuff and stuff like that, and so. He was kind of like used to running the show. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when he got there, first thing he did was talk him into, we got to get out of here. And like uh, Wayne said, he wanted to bring a friend with him. Right. Yep. And this friend of his, his name was George Dungy. Yeah. And uh, it had been reported that uh, Wayne Coleman and George Dungy, they were in a homosexual relationship. Right. Yeah. So that's probably, you know, why he wanted me to go with him. Yep. Bad thing about it, man. Uh. George was just in jail for not paying a child support payment. Yeah. So he had had a, a contempt of court citation and put in there. And I don't think he was pretty close to getting out. I think he was just a few days of getting out. He wasn't long at all. Wasn't long at all. Mm-mm. So, but uh, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. But it had been described that George Dungy, you know, he was gullible, trusting, and, and he could send to go along with this escape scheme if only Coleman warned him to. Right. And But for Carl... He, he had, didn't like it. he didn't like this at all because uh, he didn't like it because um, well first he didn't like it because he wasn't a family member and second he didn't like it because he was a black man yeah so it was at uh, three a.m. on May the fifth nineteen seventy three and this is when uh, Carl Isaacs Wayne Coleman and George Dungy they climbed through a bathroom window and got out of the prison and hid in the woods at, just outside the prison Dale well this ain't no uh, escape from Alcatraz plan no. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna go out the window and hit the woods. Go out the window and run. But just after several hours, they made their way into Baltimore, Maryland, where they stole a blue Ford Thunderbird, and they, they yeah, they left. Yeah, so they left Poplar Hill. Pretty much stole it as easy as they got out of jail. I mean, they were probably you know pretty. They were veterans by this time at stealing cars, so they knew yep. what they was doing. This is what gets me too. The authorities there at the Poplar Hill Correctional Center. They had become aware that the three men had escaped, but seeing they didn't have anything in their criminal history, they right. they didn't think the public was in any kind of danger at all. Well, yeah, well, yeah, they didn't put out you know big thing about you know this is utmost important or whatever, get these guys back or whatever, because you know, they're just basically car thieves mm-hmm. in their eyes. They no, so they didn't make a big deal out of it. Be on the lookout or anything? They right. just didn't do anything. You know, I mean, I'm well, sure they were looking for them, but they just didn't make a big deal of it. Yep. But, uh, probably the, more embarrassed than anything. Probably. Deeply. Yeah. But these three guys, they remained in the Baltimore area for two days following their escape, just enjoying their freedom before uh, Carl Isaacs decided that he wanted to go pick up his 15-year-old brother. Yeah. His name was Billy. Billy. Billy Isaacs. Billy the Kid. And he was living in the Tosin area of Baltimore County, uh, been reported with a female friend. Yeah. But he didn't hesitate to go with Carl. He idolized his brother. Right. From, you know, younger, like I said, you know, they was basically the father figure to them. Yeah. You know, so when he they showed up, he was ecstatic. He's ready to go. Yeah, that's right. Now, these four guys, four of them now, they spent the next week driving around Maryland and into Pennsylvania, just committing all kinds of crimes, uh, break-ins, uh, getting closed, uh, cash, and stealing guns. and Probably just getting, basically cash and so they could get gas money and beer money or whatever drugs or whatever and just uh, whatever they needed yeah gotta get some cash i mean you ain't rolling far if you don't have no gas but the plan according to carl was uh, to eventually head south to either florida or mexico and just live it up right 
full of drinking, drugs, and doing whatever they wanted to, crime. It's kind of odd to me that they would stick around Maryland that long oh, after got, breaking out. I've been, been on a run, yeah. yeah. Should have went to Mexico or Florida or straight off the bat. Yeah, they just hung around there for uh, <laughs> nearly a week. Yeah, it's crazy. But now on Thursday, May the 10th of 1973, they were near McConnellsburg, Pennsylvania, uh, stealing a pickup truck. Yeah, this is pretty wild. And this is when a uh, 19-year-old guy by the name of Richard Wayne Miller, he was a pretty upstanding young guy. He spotted the theft of a neighbor's vehicle. Yeah, what I what I found about this said that he was coming down the road. And he had he was driving a he had a '68 Chevy Supersport. Pretty awesome car. It's pretty yeah, I was gonna say pretty damn cool car. And he's coming down, and one report said he had actually been to the auto parts place to pick up some stuff. And I don't know if he was customizing or fixing something. Anyway, this kind of doesn't really matter but anyway he had seen he knew that was his neighbor's truck and he didn't recognize any of these four guys yeah and said he had drove by and actually passed one of his friends coming the other way and stopped and it was a girl and, and uh he asked her about it and she didn't know who they were either so he told her he was just going to park and kind of keep an eye on this see what what was going on here so he turned his car around to watch for a little while and she drove off well she didn't think nothing about it so later he drove down to go see what the day was going on here and asking what was going on with his truck well, when he got out there and asked him what was going to the truck, he tried to they tried to push him around a little bit, and he was going to he was going to throw down with him because he's thinking hands. He didn't realize they was thinking guns. Exactly. So once he got down there, they pulled a gun, and uh, they forced him into his car and then took his car. That's right. Yeah. So that's not good. Nope, it ain't. So yeah, so they forced him in the car, and now they got this car, not the truck they were trying to steal. Yep. So by Monday, May 14th of 1973, these four guys, now in Richard Miller's car, this Chevy Supersport, arrived in Donaldsonville, Georgia. Right. This is a tiny town, but it's the county seat of Seminole County, Georgia. Right. Now, just a little bit of background on Donaldsonville, Georgia. Like I said, it's a tiny little town in the southwestern corner of Georgia. It's about 20 miles north of Lake Seminole. Uh, 62 miles south of Albany and 36 miles east of Dothan, Alabama. And just a little bit more background on the town is named for a guy named John Ernest Donaldson, who built the first lumber mill in the area, which pretty much kicked off the, the town's growth. And its economy was mostly agriculture and home to 13 churches in the city. The city is roughly four square miles of land. Hmm. So... Pretty nice little farming community, and this is another little fun fact of true crime. The two Anglin brothers who escaped from Alcatraz in 1962 came from a Donaldsonville family. Hmm. But now, like we said, this Seminole County, the residents there, they respected the all-day family. Yeah. They represented the decency and just the neighborliness uh, that had pretty much embodied you know, Southern virtues. Just uh, people right. getting along and doing the right thing, farming, hard work, right, and just living the good life and just being neighborly. Yeah, they had a huge farm. Yes. Now, Ned and Ernestine Alday, they had eloped in 1935, and they eventually became parents to nine kids. And it had been reported they scrimped and saved until they could afford a small house in Donaldsonville before saving enough money to purchase a farm with a large farmhouse. This is on River Road there in Donaldsonville. It was a huge farm. I don't know how much land they had when they started, when they first bought the house and when they bought the farm. But at this time, it was like 520 acres. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. It was bigger than the town. Yeah. But when just said, oh, I guess, I don't know how big seven, whatever seven square miles is. But anyway, it was huge. So, yeah, it was a huge farm and a big undertaking. All right, Dale, so in 1973, the All Days River Road property, their farm was a working farm, and they oh, yeah. had they had animals and crops and just a big old farm there. It's huge. Yeah, Ned and Ernestine lived in the big farmhouse with their youngest children. Yeah, Ned built that house with his own hands. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. But they lived there with their youngest children, the Faye and Jimmy, and they had a son named Jerry who had married a Mary Campbell in 1970. And they moved into a trailer just a few miles down River Road from the farmhouse. Right. And they had a son, Chester, also known as Shuggy. Yeah, I heard they called him that because he was the romantic one in the family. Oh, okay. Sweet. He's sweet. Yeah, and he lived with his wife, Barbara, 
who he had married in 1969, and they lived in a trailer that was parked only a few yards from the farmhouse. Right. But like we said, the all days, they were considered hard workers who put back-breaking work into their farm, and they were also religious churchgoers. Mm-hmm. So they Every Sunday. Yes. And But they had never had any kind of run-ins with anybody. They just no. just good people, just all-around good people. That's right. Never deserved a piece, nothing. So on this morning of May the 14th, Ernestine spent the morning, as she usually did, preparing the midday meal, you know, doing household chores. And around noon... Well, you know them boys, if they get enough crack dawn working on that farm time, they, it comes around dinner time, they ready to eat. Yeah, as city folks call it, they call it lunch, but... yeah. The country people, they call it dinner time. It's dinner time. Yeah. But it was around noon, the all-day men arrived for dinner. <laughs> I was going to see what you Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, they bowed their heads like they usually do for their blessing. Then they uh, ate their lunch and talked about the farm mm-hmm. and what they needed to do. And Ned and Jerry were plowing a field at a little bit slower pace because uh, there had been some rain. And some of the fields were muddy, mm-hmm. and it was just it was just slowing down their, their progress. Right, but still got to get it done. Yeah, but Jimmy had planned to finish plowing a flat field he had started, and then plow the fields behind his Jerry's trailer after they ate their lunch. Right. And this while Shuggy would join his uncle Aubrey on equipment borrowed from a neighbor to work in a field out in the western part of their their property. And they finished lunch about one, and they all left the house, leaving. Ernestine just to clean up the dinner. Get it done. Yep. At roughly about the same time, these four bandits from Maryland came down, driving through Seminole County. Right. And But what had happened was they were going as far as Jacksonville, Florida. And when they got almost to Jacksonville, they turned around and headed back toward... This little rural, rural yeah. community, community here. Yeah, it's because... Um, Carl, he had noticed this rural Seminole County on his way into Florida. And he just felt like, you know, with the remote location and small police department, it would be perfect for doing what they wanted to do. For what they need to do, yeah. yeah. But despite their burglaries, they were they out of money. They didn't part themselves out of money. Yeah. yeah. They had spent it on beer, and well, they were running out of gas, too. Out of gas. And Carl Isaacs, he hoped to find... Some new targets or to rob some gas or siphon, siphon some gas or something. You got to get something. Yep. So it was around 4 p.m. This is when he spotted a, a tank. It was sitting alone in a field. It was about 50 feet from the road. But the tank was diesel fuel. Yeah, for tractors. Yeah, so they, they didn't get no gas there. Mm-mm. So about 15 minutes later, they appeared to find uh, another place. And this was on River Road. Mm-hmm. And it was the trailer that was belonging to Jerry... And Mary all day. Right. And it had a gas pump on the property, Dale. So Carl Isaacs and Wayne Coleman, they began ransacking the trailer. Oh, yeah. While uh, George Dungey and Billy Isaacs, they sat in the car. And this one, they saw two men in a blue Jeep approaching. Yep. And Billy had warned his brother Carl. And Jerry Alday and his father Ned pulled in behind the trailer in Jerry's Jeep. And they were unaware that the... Uh, the trailer was being burgled. What had happened, they got the tractor stuck in the field. Out in the mud, yeah. Yeah, so they, so these two had left to run back up to the trailer to see if they could find some stuff to help get the tractor unstuck. Yeah. So that's why they went back to the house, just them two, and right after they went back to work. I think they even tried the Jeep to get it unstuck with the Jeep, and they couldn't get it unstuck. Right. Yeah. But they typically would return to Jerry's home after a day of hard work just to meet the other men and plan the next day's farming work, whatever they had to do. While, you know, while Mary worked in her flower garden, like we said. But instead, they were met by Carl. He met them at gunpoint. Yeah. And ordered them to sit at the kitchen table and empty their pockets. Mm-hmm. And like I said, uh, this Ned and Jerry, you know, they were father and son. And all they got from them was a pen knife, a cigarette lighter, a wallet, and some change. We know they ain't going to be carrying much if be working in the field. You know? Heck no. Right. And 35-year-old Jerry was taken to the south bedroom of the trailer. And 66-year-old Ned was taken to the north bedroom. Right. So it was like basically a trailer with a bedroom on each end. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And Carl then shot and killed Jerry. Mm. He had to assist his brother Wayne in killing Ned because he'd been shot once in the head, and Ned got up. Tried to fight. Yeah. yeah. 
and uh, maybe he had to be shot more times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He had to come in there a couple more times. I don't know if uh, if Coleman had the heart for it. I don't think he did. Yeah. But Carl wouldn't give a damn. That's right. I think it was, every time he pulled a trigger, I think he just, more power, more power. You know, he just felt more powerful. Mm-hmm. Because he didn't care. But the later autopsy showed that Ned, the dad, had been shot six times with two different pistols. Mm. A twenty two caliber and a thirty two caliber. Yeah. And Jerry had been shot four times with a twenty two caliber. Right. So Carl went and shot Jerry, right? So he just shot him, killed him, and then went in and had to help him kill Ned. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's why there's so many times, because he used both their guns. But it wasn't much longer. Uh, Jimmy all day. This was another son of Ned, and his brother Jerry drove up on a green John Deere tractor. Right. Now, whether it's the same tractor or not, we're not sure. But what had happened, you know, these guys never came back to the field. So they're like, what the hell's going on? Yeah, they went looking for them. Yeah, so they either they got the tractor free or it was a different tractor. And I'm, I'm assuming they probably got it free. I'm not sure. And then just drove it up there to see what was going on let them know we got it out. But that's, they, that's what I'm thinking. But they walked to the back door of the mobile home, and they knocked on the door, and they were greeted by a pistol. Yep, right in the face. Yeah. And um, Wayne Coleman took the hat off of Jerry and a pair of sunglasses mm-hmm. and a nearly empty wallet. And Carl confronted Jimmy, accusing him of coming to the trailer because he had heard gunshots, to which Jimmy denied but likely realized at the same moment that someone, probably his brother, had been shot. And Carl took him to the living room where Jimmy was forced to lie on the sofa. Mm. And this is when Carl shot 25-year-old Jimmy twice in the back of the head. And his autopsy later revealed that Jimmy had been shot twice with the twenty two caliber so pistol. So we're saying that Carl's one carrying the twenty two. you think? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So after murdering Jimmy, Carl went outside to move the tractor. Yeah, because the tractor had blocked in their car. That's right. Yeah, when he rolled up, he's like, hmm, what's the car? And he just parked it and went around. But yep. Yeah, it actually blocked him in. This when Jerry's wife, Mary, drove up in her car to the now crowded driveway. You and know, this bad thing, you know, when uh, he was in there and he was getting ready to kill Jerry. And he's asking if he was married. Yeah. And, and he said, yeah. He said, but they ain't used to waiting on her. She ain't never got better dollar to. And then he seen the look in Carl's eye and he knew he had messed up by telling him that. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah, the best thing he could have done is just say, no, he ain't married. Right. Yeah, because this, this ain't good. Maybe they, didn't, maybe they went ahead and left. Right. Yeah. If it had time, I don't know how how what the timeline is as far as minutes, as far as, you know, her showing up. But, yeah, it wasn't good. But Mary drove up in her car to the crowded driveway, and seeing her, Carl jumped off the tractor and came up behind her. And she pulled a paper bag of groceries from the car, and he pulled a pistol on her. And he ordered her into the trailer. Right. Where his first act was to, de- I guess, to demean her by knocking the bag of groceries out of her hands. He's just being a dick. He was. And uh, she had seen what they'd done to her father-in-law and brother-in-law. Can you imagine the scene? When she I can't imagine. I mean, dang, good. But she was robbed of some possessions, and uh, she had a Timex watch that was taken from her. And mm-hmm. when Carl dumped out her purse, uh, it just contained her car keys, perfume, and her wallet that had one dollar. One dollar. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. That's all they got. That's when the two men in the pickup truck pulled up, and this was Shuggy and Aubrey all day. Mm-hmm. The son and other brother of Ned all day. Yeah, and they're like, "Where in the hell is everybody at?" Yeah, and they were laughing and made no effort to get out of their vehicle. So Carl decided to go and get them, and he took his brother Billy with him. Mm-hmm. And the two each took a truck door and ordered the men out and into the trailer at gunpoint. Yeah, so they just walked up to each each side of the truck with a gun in your face and get out and get in the house. And Carl was accusing the men of laughing at him. Right. There's that syndrome again. Yeah, but Shuggy and Aubrey spotted Mary crying uncontrollably. And this is when they ordered them to sit on the kitchen floor. And Wayne Coleman collected some towels from the kitchen and headed to the north bedroom while Carl and George Dungey took Mary into the bathroom. Right. And this is when they asked uh, George Dungey just to guard Mary. Keep an eye on her. Yeah. And Shuggy, who had just turned 30 years old just about a week earlier, was taken by Wayne Coleman to the north bedroom where his father was mm. laying dead. And he was shot. And Aubrey, 57-year-old, was taken by Carl to the other side of the trailer where his brother Jerry's body was laying and where he, he was killed. Killed him, yeah. Yeah. And their autopsy revealed that Aubrey had been shot once with a thirty-eight caliber pistol 
and Shugi had been shot with the 380 caliber pistol. So they've swapped guns now. It sounds like it, yeah. yeah. And when he was found, Aubrey's fingers laid folded over Jerry's. It was almost as if the last moment they just reached out and he held his nephew's hand. Can you imagine? No. But Mary, Lord help, she was taken from the, the bathroom and taken to the kitchen table yeah. where she was raped by Carl and then by Wayne. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. Now, these four guys, they had blindfolded Mary and put her in the car. Yeah, gagged her, blindfolded her, and threw her in the car. And they drove her to a heavily wooded area several miles away where Mary was pulled from the car by her hair. You drag her up by the hair of the head. Man. Yeah, and she was raped two more times by Carl. Right. And once by George Nungy. Yeah, and some, some reports say that they forced George to do it, to go out there and rape her. I'd almost believe that. Yeah, because so far he ain't got his hands dirty. You know, so I'm like, well. He's gonna, just there. Yeah, you're going to do something or, you know, whatever. Now, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but that's what I'd read. And to degrade her even more, Dale, mm. photographs of her were taken with an Instamatic camera that was stolen from the trailer. Right. And one photo was found of her uh, just showing her frightened and nude and only just a few minutes prior to her death. Right. You know, it was reported also that Mary was just begging, and she wasn't begging for them not to kill her, that she was begging them to let her put her clothes back on before they kill her. Wow. So she wouldn't be found like that. Can you imagine? No. Sick, man. Sick. But Mary was 25 years old at the time, but she was shot in the back and once in the back of the head. Yeah. And her autopsy would reveal... That not only has she been repeatedly raped, but she had been shot with a twenty two caliber pistol. Yeah, and George Dungy killed her. Yeah. They were going to go kill her, and he said, let me do it. Wow. So I guess he's trying to prove himself now after they've done, made him do what he did. So the four guys, they abandoned Richard Miller's uh, Chevy Super Sport car. Well, it was probably out of gas, you know, and if it was a Super Sport, it probably is not very good on gas much. No. So that's when they decided to keep Mary's car. It was a Chevy Impala. Right. And they later abandoned this car in Alabama. Right. Dale, these murders, it shocked and terrified Donaldsonville. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, it just... A little bitty town or nothing, and then you got this whole family just killed. Yeah, because they've been reporting, you know, people didn't lock their doors around there. Right. I mean, it was just... Early 70s, you know. Yeah. In context, but yeah, there's probably a a lot of a lot of places like that was like that then. And a lot of these people around, they were just barely eking out a living as the all days had, you know, and they would... People just friendly yeah well it was it was easier times in for sure i mean it was hard working but i'm just saying you know not a lot going on it's just farmers hanging out and family but here's another thing too the terrifying details of mary's last hours of life were kept from her mom because her mom had been declining in health right originally Mary's mother was told that, you know, she had been shot and killed instantly. Right. She had she'd been shot and died instantly, and, and that's all. They, they left it at that and didn't tell her anymore. They didn't give her any details. But there was some kind of neighbor that went to Mary's mother. Unintentionally. Yeah. And told her all the facts. Everything. About Mary's last moments. Uh, just, you know, she'd been shot, raped. Including that she was the last one to die after she'd seen every, all this other. Witnessed two murders and seen all these dead people. Yeah. So it was just all this traumatic stuff that happened to her before she was raped and killed herself. Found nude and everything. Right. So Mrs. Campbell, she sank into a diabetic coma mm. just shortly after learning about this. And just and, died a few hours later. Man. Yeah. And I did see on one thing that they actually had a uh, a family pet of all these folks, and it, it died not long after this, too. Wow. Probably heartbroken, you know. My kid, man, it's crazy. It's crazy. These people are just evil. Don't care. So on May the 17th of 1973, social and commercial activities came to a halt in Donaldsonville. They shut everything down. Yeah. The mayor called for a day of mourning, and they closed every business in town. Yeah. So this is for the all-day funerals to begin. And by the time the funeral services began for Ned, Aubrey, Shuggy, Jerry, Mary, and Jimmy, wow. nearly all the townspeople, joined by hundreds of others from surrounding counties, they gathered at the Spring Creek Baptist Church. And the church that Ned... He had actually helped them build it. Yeah, he had helped them build it, yeah. Yeah. 
and where the all day all the all day men and Mary have been officers and teachers in his Sunday school classes. So this must be devastating for his community, man. This is where uh, Shuggy and Barbara all day, and also Jerry and Mary all day have been married. Right. But the church itself wasn't equipped to handle six full size coffins. <sighs> yeah, and the large attendance of people there. Well, can you imagine? I'm sure it's just a small community church. I mean, yeah. I mean, hell, now, even big churches, I mean, how are you going to put six six coffins? You can't, man. It's ridiculous. But the decision was made to have the services on the cemetery grounds right. to accommodate all that wanted to attend. Yeah. And there were so many flower arrangements delivered that they were stacked on flowers around the coffins and graves. And there were also a, a lot of dignitaries that attended the funeral. Uh, it was reported that uh, Governor Jimmy Carter, who was uh, later president, but he was a governor of Georgia at the time, his mother Lillian had attended the funeral. All right, now George Dungey, he was the first of the killers captured, and he was taken into custody on May the 17th, the day of the all-day funeral. Yeah, I think they had actually had run up on a roadblock, and when they come up on it, they all decided to run for it and said George wasn't the fastest runner, so he was caught right off the bat. Yep. And for over two hours, he told of a tale of assault, rape, and murder. And he confessed that he'd been able to un- he'd been unable to sleep since all that happened. Since what he'd done to that woman. Yes. Or since what we had done is what he said. Yeah, that was his quote of saying, what we had done to that woman. Yeah. And that only Billy Isaacs, this was the young kid. 15-year-old. Of, yeah. yeah. He was innocent of everything, rape and murder. He was just alone. Right. But ballistics showed how that... The all days had been killed with four different types of gun, one of which Billy Isaacs had been carrying. Right. And I, I remember, you know, hearing this and I was going, wait a minute, you know, but as you look at it, you know, we also know they've been switching off guns, just depending on what. So I'm sure, I don't think Billy, I really don't think, he didn't have the stomach for this. No, he was just a kid, man. Yeah, he didn't know what all the, what the hell was going on when they come picked him up. Mm-mm. And I had seen some stuff where he said, you know, right back when they picked him up in Maryland and they were partying and he was getting ready to leave to Florida, he was like, you can just take me back home now. And he was like, nah, you're going with us to Florida. And then, you know, he didn't really, he didn't really like what was going on, but what is he going to do? That's right. Unless he wanted to be next. But Wayne Coleman's story was a little bit different from George Dungy's. Dungy told his story with a certain level of remorse and sorrow and just, you know, feeling bad about it. But man, Wayne, you think about it, man, he was fixing to get out of jail. Yeah, just days from getting out. But Wayne Coleman appeared to have a good time talking about all this. You know, he was boastful and just like he enjoyed it. Like he, you know. Like a great adventure here. Yeah. But Coleman was fuzzy so much that he asked officers if Alabama was part of Georgia and if Louisiana was a county in Mississippi. That's pretty sad. Yeah, he just didn't know his. And the big difference when, you know, Dungey had a really clear, you know, details of everything he didn't forget nothing i'm sure he was pretty traumatized too he he didn't realize what he was getting into either i don't think he just was going to escape with his his partner i guess you should say and then got in the middle of all this hell yeah and billy isaacs this is the young kid his account was very similar to that of george dungy right insofar as which all day family members arrived at the trailer and when and in which order they were killed yeah he knew it all yeah and he also claimed he'd not murdered anyone that's right and only Carl Isaacs of the four refused to say anything about what happened on March on May the 14th, 1973, other than it was a pretty May day. Yeah. Wow. But now these four escaped inmates were returned to Seminole County on May the 24th of 1973, right. just 10 days after the murders. Right, because when they went on the run from here, you know, they kind of went and swung out through, what, Alabama and back up through Tennessee and they did. through Virginia, kind of made a loop, and then they, they found them there. Mm-hmm. That's right. And they each faced six counts of murder as well as felony charges of rape, kidnapping, armed robbery, and theft of Mary Alday's car. Right. But the community had been shocked and saddened by all these murders, and they were now outraged, demanding that these guys were indeed guilty and justice to be served. you damn right. And people were hollering out in the street, Fry them. all. And it was alleged that there were suggestions that – People were wanting to form a lynch mob and to execute a swift and street, form a street, street justice. Yeah, yeah, street justice, baby. The four defendants being placed in four separate jails miles apart only seemed to bolster these rumors, dude. Yeah, they didn't want to leave them in one place. No, they separate them, get them apart. 
Now, with the Isaac brothers, this was Carl and Billy. Wayne Coleman and Dungey were under arrest. The long wait for the family of Richard Miller, the missing guy from Pennsylvania, yeah. was finally about to come to an end with the discovery of his car at the Mary Alday body site. Right. Yeah, this is where they found his car. Mm-hmm. And eyewitnesses in Pennsylvania who gave accounts of the men that Richard was chasing, authorities su- suspected that the boy was likely dead, but wanted to locate his body return it to the family. Right. And following several hours of negotiation in which was assured that nothing he said or did could be used against him, Wayne Coleman agreed to return to Pennsylvania to help recover Richard's body. And shortly after his arraignment on May the 24th, he was taken by plane to Maryland where he was laughing and told authorities that he'd pulled the trigger himself. I don't know why I would take him. Hell, he didn't even know where he was. Now, for three days, he led heavily armed officers in circles around Pennsylvania, Maryland border, just trying to help them look for this guy. And he didn't even know where he was. No. He basically was just taking on a goose chase. But uh, Wayne Coleman was uh, eventually returned back to Georgia. Yeah. With Wayne Coleman's failure to help locate Richard's body, authorities were surprised to find Carl Isaacs willing to help. Mm-hmm. And like Wayne Coleman, he was transported to Pennsylvania, and he utterly was devoid of any signs of remorse. He didn't care. Mm-mm. He had a pretty nearly photographic memory of landmarks and uh, where they had traveled, and he easily directed the police to the exact route they had taken. Right. From when Richard Miller had taken pursuit you know, when they had um, they took can't. that truck, yeah. Yeah. And the group was taken to a small town of Flintstone, Maryland, where uh, Isaacs gave the police detailed instructions on where to find Richard's body. Yeah, even though he didn't want to accompany them when they go to find it. But it was exactly where he told them it would be. Yeah. And later it said, you know, Carl said, you know, the day that Richard it came up on them when they were trying to take that truck, he said the boy didn't know it, but as soon as he walked up, he was a dead man. Wow. Yeah. So that's when they... They threw him in his car and took his car, you know, and then took him out here and killed him. They went actually went in the woods, tied his hands behind his back, and then Carl shot him in the head. Yeah. They found him on a logging road. Yep. Yeah. And they forced him to his knees and then argued over who would be the one to kill him. Mm-hmm. Over his pleas to spare his life. And like I said, he was shot in the back of the head and his body among the tra- left among the trash. Just laying there. Crazy. Carl Isaac, I mean, he was excited about the death of this young guy. Now, before the first trial started of Carl Isaacs, Billy Isaacs, the younger brother, made a deal with Prosecutor Dale, yeah. who felt that Billy being ineligible for the death penalty due to his age was less culpable of than other defendants, was the best eyewitness. Well, they knew they couldn't get him for death penalty, so they just tried to offer him a deal because they knew he could tell them what the hell happened. Yeah, but rather than going to trial, Billy would be sentenced to two 20-year terms for burglary, car theft, and the maximum sentence he would receive and would testify against the three other defendants. Right. So on uh, December the 31st of 1973, before Judge Walter Gere, uh, Special Prosecutor Peter Gere, the nephew of Walter Gere, the judge, he had known Ned Alday, the patriarch of the family, as well as other family members, and he'd even fished with them and been to their house and hung out with them. Right. But he was eager to prosecute these men. I bet. Yeah. Because uh, Georgia had just... Reinstated, or had instated a new capital punishment statute. Yeah. So he was eager to get this done. Yeah. And he managed to see the jury on the first day. Now, on uh, New Year's Day, January 1, 1974, it was a pretty speedy presentation. And the prosecutor called Bud Alday... Uh, to be followed by the sheriff as eyewitnesses to the defendants being in the vicinity of the Alday property Correct. on May the 14th, 1973. And to one of Mary Alday's co-workers who identified her Timex watch that was found in the possession of her of the defendants. Right. Next and, up, they called Shuggy Alday's wife, Barbara, and uh, basically who identified a briefcase that had belonged to her husband containing his driver's license, fishing license, and some dental appointment cards and some other stuff. That was found there, too. Right. So then they, they called some police officers, some crime lab techs, and then the doctor who performed the autopsies before he arrived to his 11th witness. And this yeah. would be his star witness. Yeah, this would be 16-year-old Billy Isaacs. Right. This was the younger brother of Carl. And Billy took stand on the afternoon of January the 4th, and he was just only a few feet 
from the surviving all day children and his brother Carl, who glared at him from the defense table. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And over the next two hours, he recounted meeting up with Carl, his brother, Wayne Coleman, and George Dungey, following their escape all the way to the river road where the all days lived. Mm-hmm. And he spoke as George Dungey had of the all days last painful moments of life of the pr- prolonged torture inflicted on Mary Alday and the death and destruction wreaked in the small trailer of Jerry and Mary Alday. And particularly painful to the Alday family and the attendants and those who had known and cared for the Alday victims was Billy's testimony that Carl Isaacs, after robbing him, had asked Jerry Alday if he were married, like right. we talked about. Yeah, man. To which Jerry had responded truthfully, but had told um, Carl that he was no need to wait for his wife that she had no more than a dollar with her yeah so so billy was letting all this out in court man yeah billy also testified that when carl had gone to kill aubrey all day as wayne coleman was killing sugi all day his gun had only clicked and carl had shot it so many times it ran out of bullets Mm -hmm. and he had to run to billy and grab his pistol and then gone back into the bedroom after which Billy had testified he heard one or two shots. That's why they thought Billy's gun had been used. Yeah. Because he come and got his gun because he had run out of bullets. Yeah. Carl, Billy said, was laughing when he came out of the bedroom saying that damn bastard begged for mercy. This dude is cold, man. Yeah. Carl Isaacs. Yeah, he's a piece of work. Mm. Both the prosecution and the defense made their closing arguments on January the 5th, and the case went to the jury. And So this is five-day five-day trial yeah for this wow and 68 minutes later the jury reached a verdict finding carl isaacs guilty on all counts the penalty phase of carl isaacs trial began on january the 7th with peter gear stressing that it was the jury's duty to protect the citizens of seminole county from people like carl isaacs and the only way to absolutely make sure that he would never commit such a crime again was to impose death upon him oh yeah and they just, they even said that Carl yawned and appeared to be bored during all this. And 38 minutes after Carl's lawyer gave a plea for his client's life, the jury voted for death. Now, the trial against George Dungy began nine days later. They were just spitting these, these trials yeah, out, dude. Ain't nothing like now, is it? Yeah, George Dungy, his trial began nine days later and followed the same format as Carl Isaacs. And 58 minutes after the jury got it, the case they returned their verdict of guilty on all counts although dungy's attorney he offered a plea for his client's life against the death penalty in general and the jury deliberated less than two hours before voting for death Mm. but uh it was reported that dungy reportedly received his sentence without any kind of emotion at all he probably thinking damn i was ready to go home yeah i was gonna be out and free man Mm. now wayne coleman's trial was the last but like the two previous, it was a three-day trial that ended in a guilty verdict on all counts after the jury deliberated for 50 minutes. And Coleman sort of wrung his hands nervously through the whole trial and fidgeted. Yeah. And well, he, But he was sentenced to death 50 minutes after his attorney pleaded for his life. Yeah, he just got up and said, thanks, Judge. Yeah. What the hell? Before being led away. Wow. But these trials were, they were quick and carrying out the sentence of themselves judge gear had set the execution dates initially as for february the 15th of 74 yeah he was pissed off he figured if they all all the all days had died together there's no reason these killers shouldn't all die together exactly that's what he wanted but of course you know they got to have all these mandatory and automatic appeals yeah. to go to the georgia supreme court so going forward in time over the next decade yeah instead of instead of this all happening in half a month no or a month and a half yeah that's what they was trying to get it done but no we still dragging it out yeah over the next decade multitudes of appeals and filings were made by the three defendants with new executions date and then postponed due to filings mm-hmm. and all the appeals and motions were denied until a discovery motion was uh, made in 1979 it was granted putting into gear what would lead to retrials in 1988 mm. And in 1975, Billy Isaacs, this is the young kid, being the only one of the four defendants not under the death sentence, was returned to Maryland to stand trial for the kidnap and murder of Richard Wayne Miller. Right. 
and he was being charged as an accomplice. Correct. And he was found guilty and sentenced to 60 years, which would run concurrent to his 40-year sentence in Georgia, meaning he could potentially serve 50 years before being eligible for parole. So in the spring of 74, Carl Isaacs agreed to an interview with a writer from the Albany Herald, and it sparked off uh, multiple interviews and a passion for Isaac's fame. Yeah. He claimed, among other things, that on the first anniversary of the all-day murders, he would send a note to Wayne Coleman, who's on death row cell, was just down the hall from him, a note wishing him happy anniversary. What a dick. Man. Yeah, and his life ambition, he said, was to murder a thousand people. And his backup plan was even more humorous, and he, he was wanting to be a practicing attorney. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He kind of joking and said, well, I guess the bar would never accept him. That's right. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. And But uh, Carl also threatened his younger brother, Billy, saying that he would never live to hit the streets again. And if both of them were free, Billy would be the first person he would kill. Man. I guess because he testified against him. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He's pissed off. And he claimed not to think about the all-day murders themselves, but in the same breath gave a respect to kind of respect to Mary all day for being the only one out of all of them who put up a fight. Yeah. And said the rest of them just, just laid down and got shot. Yeah. And he also admitted he'd like to get out and kill more of the all days because they, these type of people, they represented a type of society that he just didn't like. Right. They were church going folks, humble and hard workers. Yeah. He just didn't like him kind of people. Yeah. What a, what a guy. He wanted to kill them all. Kill them all. Yeah, he said there didn't nobody give a damn about this family till he killed him. Only thing the all days ever stood for was just get killed by me. That's the only thing that made him stand out. Stood, the only made, thing that made him stand out. They was just farmers. Wow. Good Lord. Yeah, the only sympathy he had was for himself. That's right. Yeah. Now, what was surprising was that uh, the Isaac's own mother called for his execution, stating that she didn't want her sons, Carl Isaacs and Wayne Coleman, around if they were going to be killing all right, now, on November 26th of 1985, a guard at the Georgia Classification and Diagnostic Center in Jackson, Georgia, discovered the entire front portion of a ventilation system in Carl Isaac's cell had been cut through. Mm-hmm. So close had Isaacs been to the potential escape that layer after layer of screens, lures, and metal backings had been penetrated through the plumbing behind his cell, yeah. leaving only a single set of thin steel bars in the skylight above the bars and Isaac's plan to escape with three other inmates and it was only going to be just hours later so, yeah so he's, so this he's guy just, this, yeah. yeah he's fixing to be out yeah yeah but they found it they found it just in time mm-hmm. Crazy. so on December 9th 1985 there was a three judge panel on the 11th circuit of the United States Court of Appeals concluded that due to the inflammatory and prejudicial pretrial publicity Carl Isaacs, Wayne Coleman, and George Dungey could not have received fair trials that each of the defendants should have been granted a change of venue and the error in not doing so was unconstitutional. So, thus the conviction and death row sentences of Carl Isaacs, Wayne Coleman, and George Dungey were set aside yeah. despite all this overwhelming evidence They're all of their guilt. Brand new trials. All three of them. All three of them. Brand new trials. They should have just had the damn... Street justice got it over with. Yep. So on August 18th of 1986, Isaacs, Coleman, and Dungey were transferred from death row to Chatham County Jail in Savannah to await new trials. And only a few days later, Judge Walter C. McMillan, Jr. of Sandersville, was appointed to preside over all three trials. And on August the 30th, he re- appointed six new lawyers to defend these three guys. Lawyers for uh, Coleman and Dungey filed a motion challenging McMillan, charging that he was prejudiced against both poor and black defendants. And despite the motion being denied after hearing the defense lawyer's appeal to the Georgia Supreme Court, additional adding an additional seven-month delay to the entire process. So unlike the first trial, which had moved along pretty quick, the second trial did not start until nine volumes of defense motions and voir dire examinations had been completed. And it was January the 3rd of 1988 before Ferguson stood before the court to begin his case and worried that the presence of the crying all-day family members in the courtroom might prejudice their clients' rights. 
Carl Isaac's attorney made the motion for a mistrial, and once it was denied, request that the court order the spectators be quiet or removed. Yeah. So if they was crying, they was going to kick them out. Yeah. So Judge Lawson acted in an abundance of caution, and he issued a warning that displays of emotion would not be tolerated, that anyone who could not control their emotions would need to leave the courtroom until they could resume control. What? Mm. Yeah, this got the all-day family. Yeah. Who noted that while they were taken to task for crying, the Isaacs family were free to cry in the courtroom and on the stand as well. And Ernestine Alday, this was the matron of the family. She managed to hold it together, dude, while on the stand. And she was showing a picture of the trailer taken the day after the murders. And when she saw her late husband's pipe and an ashtray on the table, that's when she lost she it. She lost it, yeah. Yeah. That's awful, man. And it was nearly 1.30 in the afternoon on January the 23rd of 1988. Billy Isaac took the stand, and he repeated the events on May the 14th of 1973. And he didn't alter from his testimony then. I mean, it was a pretty Almost much verbatim, the same. yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. They tried to shake him up a little bit, as attorneys did, but he didn't, he didn't fluster at all. Yep. Even the state called a film writer and filmmaker by the name of Fleming Fuller to take the stand. And Fuller interviewed Carl Isaacs in Reedsville in 1976. Yeah, when he was talking all that junk. Yeah, and Isaacs agreed to tell his story on film. And in a world of kind of ironic, Carl became a witness. Against himself. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you get for bragging. Now, he was shown on camera his voice, emotionless and sort of monotone, and he recounted the all-day murders. Besides getting the sequence of the shootings incorrect, he mentioned that while leaving Aubrey all day in the bedroom to take Billy's gun from him, Aubrey managed to get a hold of a 12-gauge shotgun that had been standing in the corner, but Carl managed to shoot him first. And he was also blamed for Mary all day for her death by claiming that he had told her that she gave him no hassle if he would save her life. Yeah, he killed her anyway yeah. after a rape her four or five times. But Isaac's attorney called no witnesses on uh, his behalf. So on January 25th, 1988, this was about 6.45 in the evening. After deliberating for over two hours, the jury reached a verdict, and they found Carl Isaacs guilty on all six counts of murder. Well, I don't know why it took two hours. Let's oh, really? make it look good. I guess. I guess they probably got supper. Yeah. And the penalty phase in Carl Isaacs' trial began on January 26th. And Ferguson argued for the death penalty, citing that not only the heinous nature of the crimes, but Isaac's two nearly successful escapes from prison mm-hmm. and his boastful accounts of them. And he also brought up Isaac's evil nature, calling to the stand an eyewitness from the local TV station. This was a reporter who had interviewed Isaac several years after the murders. And the reporter recalled that he had asked Isaacs if, if he had to do it over again, would he have committed the murders? And Isaac Replied that he would. Yeah, I'd do it all over. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, in closing of all this, Isaac's attorney claimed that the rape of Mary Alday had not been a rape, but rather Carl Isaac's way of assaulting his own mother, for whom he had some hatred for. Good Lord. Yeah. How shit is that? And the jury deliberated for one hour and 52 minutes before finding Carl Isaac's uh, should be put to death. Wayne Coleman's retrial took place in Decatur, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta in April. And Coleman was 41 at the time, and he lost all his teeth, and his hair was nearly white. Mm. Coleman's attorney blamed Carl Isaacs, uh, saying that he was one of the most manipulative persons you'd ever meet. He's probably right about that. Yep. And Billy Isaacs, whom he described as exactly like Carl, a killer, a manipulator, who had cut a deal with the state. Yeah, I don't believe that part. He also called two clinical psychologists to take the stand, one to testify to Carl Isaac's psychological makeup and one to testify as Coleman's. Yeah. Now, Prosecutor Ferguson once again presented much of the same case that had been presented back in 1974, relying on the physical evidence that Billy Isaac's eyewitness testimony to prove Coleman's guilt. And on April 29th, the case went to the jury who enjoyed a hamburger meal before finding Wayne Coleman guilty on all six counts of murder. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they, they got supper. These, these new trials aren't helping them at all. No. Well, they should, should have never had a new trial, my, yep. in my opinion. Nope. And with Carl Isaacs, the penalty phase for Wayne Coleman began the next day. And unlike Isaacs, uh, Coleman's attorney put the clinical psychologist who had interviewed and administered tests to Coleman on the stand. And the doctor testified to Coleman's passive follower-type personality, 
his overall depression as a human being and his character being ripe for picking by someone like Carl Isaacs. He also claimed that Wayne Coleman not only felt guilt over the murders, but he also prayed to God for his forgiveness. All right, unlike the penalty decision in Carl Isaacs' case, this one was not quick. From the moment the jury retired to deliberate, there was one stalemate. One juror, as a 22-year-old woman, had stated flatly that she would not vote for the death penalty. Right. Despite her apparent inflexibility and deliberations had continued, complete with bursts of arguments, screams, and crying for the next six days. And at 10.20 a.m. on May the 11th, following a reported 35-hour straight deliberation, the jury foreman sent word to the judge that there was a deadlock Mm -hmm. and the jurors were unable to agree on a sentence. Judge Lawson was forced to declare a mistrial under Georgia law. This meant that Wayne Coleman would receive a life sentence and be eligible for parole in 15 years. 15 years. Wow. Hmm, Poor old Billy didn't do that and he won't be eligible for 50 years. Yeah, exactly. And satisfied that the jury spared his life, Coleman opted not to appeal. Yeah, he was getting a sweet deal. Yeah, he just shut up and took it. Yeah. Now, George Dungy had been the next and last in line for retrial, but in 1988, the Georgia General Assembly had decreed that mentally retarded individuals could not be ex- executed in Georgia. And Dungy, who had been repeatedly begin, I'm been given IQ tests, had never scored higher than 68, met the requirements that the state judged people whose IQ was lower than 70 to be mentally retarded. Right. So basically saying he never got a higher enough score to be convicted of the death penalty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so on July the 14th of 1988, George Dungy plead guilty by reason of mental retardation to six counts of murder and was sentenced to six consecutive life terms. Man. So the years continued to roll while Coleman and Dungy served their sentence and Carl Isaac continued to appeal his death sentence, the appeals of which were basically reset on his conviction. Hmm. But for the all-day family, the years brought new tragedies. The death of five all-day men, all farmers, and family businesses simply couldn't be sustained. Yeah, you know, basically, I mean, they don't have nobody to work to farm anymore. I mean, that first year, all the neighbors, you know, come in and help, you know, tend the crops and do it, but they just knew it wasn't feasible to continue doing that, you know, and after, you know, a year or so, they just started selling off farm equipment, trying to save what they could save. Mm -hmm. Now, prior to his death, Ned Alday had deeded his property to his three sons, Jerry, Shuggy, and Jimmy, and he knew that they would never take advantage of him, and they felt like they would take care of the land and protect the land if anything had happened to him. Right. He was just trying to look out for, you know, down the road. And none of them could have guessed what, you know, Isaacs, Coleman, and them brothers, and George Dungy would do to destroy their family. Yeah, they didn't know they'd come in and kill them all on the same day. And Ned's death, the property passed to Jerry, Shuggy, and Jimmy, all of whom died shortly after he did. Yeah. And this uh, Ernestine Alday had lived on for 40 years. It was no longer hers. The land was eventually sold off in plots with Ernestine keeping a small parcel of land where she built a small little house for herself. Yeah, so basically he had, you know, give it to his sons instead of, you know, just leaving it alone. And then when he was killed, it went to them. And they was killed, it went to Mary. And when she was killed, it went to her. So Ernestine just kind of got jacked out of her own place because he was trying to look out for her down the road. Yeah. Because these dudes come in here and killed the whole damn family. Mm-hmm. And there were books and movies done about this, and the all-day family never received a penny from any of this. And with each new legal action and maneuver made by one of the killers, the all-days were forced to relive that terrible day on May. Over and over and over Over and again. Over. That happened in May of 73. For damn 20 years. Yeah. So in 1993, Billy Isaacs, this is the young boy with him, he was released from prison following a 1991 agreement that he had been paroled, and he served 20 years. I guess that's better than 50. Yeah, exactly. And in October of 1988, Ernestine Alday had died, mm. and she was buried alongside her husband and children at the Spring Creek Baptist Church Cemetery. And less than a year later, in September of 1999, her sole surviving son, the oldest child, Norman, who had, he had actually been in the military at the time of the murders. Right. And he was a command sergeant major in the Army. Uh, he had died in Colorado at the age of 63. Sad. Mm-hmm. It is. 
So on May the 6th of 2003, 30 years and one day after escaping from prison in Maryland, Carl Isaacs. His, his time is running out. It is. And his death penalty was coming to fruition. Yes. And he requested a meal, just the regular tray that they fixed every, every inmate. Yeah, for his final meal. Yeah, he said it was just some, some kind of pork, uh, macaroni, pinto beans, some cabbage, a carrot salad and dinner roll, chocolate cake, and fruit punch. And he didn't even eat it. No. Didn't even touch it. No. Nope. And he was given lethal injection and pronounced dead at 8.07 p.m. And no one from his family was present at his execution. Right. And he was there supported by his attorney and two ministers who witnessed the execution. And Isaacs denied making a final statement, but did request a final prayer to which he reportedly mouthed, Amen. Yep. And there were members of the surviving Alday family that were present for the execution marking the first time in Georgia that members of a victim's family were permitted to watch an execution. Wow. And Isaacs became the second condemned inmate to be put to death in Georgia in 2003 and 32nd in the U.S. that year. And he actually holds the record for being on death row longer than any other inmate in the United States. That's a damn travesty. It is. Now, George Dungey, had died of a heart attack on April 4th, 2006. And he was in prison in Reedsville, Georgia, and he was 68 years old. Billy Isaacs. Had, he, was, he was the youngest one. Yeah, he was the youngest. On May the 4th, 2009, almost 36 years to the day that his brothers escaped from prison, he died in Florida where he had relocated, and he was 51 years old. Crazy. When it started, he was 15. When he died, he was 51. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Now, Wayne Coleman, he actually continues to serve his sentence in the Georgia State Prison in Reedsville. And although eligible for parole, he has been denied, and he is currently 74 years old. Trash. Yeah. But this is a pretty sad case, dude. It is, man. It's, it's just, there's a lot of sad stuff here and a bunch of, bunch of ridiculousness. And this little town of Donaldsonville, Georgia, was, you know, even though it's been 50 years since this. It 50 is, years this year, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's still... This town still feels the impact of this horrible crime. Oh, yeah. Just because they was out with Joey Radden and... Yeah, wanting to kill and party and have a good time. Yeah. Pitiful. Pitiful. Well, we want to thank your buddy Mondo for suggesting this case. And uh, Dogs fan. And Dogs fan. Dogs fan, 8523. 8523. Yeah. We want to thank him for suggesting this uh, Georgia case. It was a crazy one. Yeah, it's a long one, but we got it done. Yes. Let's roll. All right, we want everyone to be safe. Please be careful and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is Crack House House Chronicles. Chronicles.